Boldwood Presents I Will Find You Written by Sally Rigby and Amanda Ashby And read by Nikki Diss The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Jessica Sunday the 19th of June Jessica Burton Cartwright did that thing so many working mothers did when they found themselves with a tiny pocket of time. She turned her attention away from her four-year-old twins as they stirred a bowl of cake batter in the kitchen of their leafy London semi-detached house and focused on the overgrown hydrangea bush that the landscape gardener had convinced them to keep. It was definitely a mistake. Sitting outside the glass doors that led from the kitchen to the manicured garden beyond, it was like a flaw in her otherwise perfect life. Its flowers never went the same vibrant blue as the one at her childhood home, but rather a muddy red colour that made them look half dead, even in the height of summer. Apparently it was because of the soil, but whatever the case, Jessica still didn't like it. She made a mental note to call the gardener and have it removed. Besides, Henry had been talking about getting a pizza oven, and that would be the ideal spot. Eleanor's whiny voice forced Jessica to step away from her stolen moment of time. It's my turn. I want to help bake the cake. But you're making a mess, Florence objected, sounding more like a pensioner than a child. She was the leader of the two, having been born five minutes earlier. Eleanor tended to follow her around and was happy to do what her sister wanted. Most of the time, they were the best of friends. No, I won't, Eleanor retorted, her lower lip beginning to tremble. Tell her, Mummy. Why don't we let Florence finish stirring while we line the cake tin? Plus, we still have to make the icing. Jessica pressed a kiss into her daughter's glossy brown hair. Even though they shared the same long lashes and dark brown eyes, they weren't identical. Florence's complexion was almost alabaster, while Eleanor took after Henry's family with darker skin and a wide mouth. Can we make it green? Florence said, losing interest in the batter as she turned to where the icing sugar was sitting on the kitchen island. Jessica swallowed. The plan had been to make a cake to celebrate what would have been her father's 60th birthday, but the girls had seen the bowls and insisted on helping. Besides, it had been a difficult enough day. Upsetting them would only make it worse. Green it is, she nodded. Now, we'd better get moving if we want to get it finished before tea time. The twins immediately looked at each other, eyes solemn as they did that slightly disconcerting thing when they appeared to talk to each other in their silent language. An hour later, the spilt flour and sugar had been cleaned up and the freshly iced cake sat centre stage on the expensive marble kitchen island, while Jessica had also managed to prepare the rest of the meal. She was just taking the leg of lamb out of the oven to rest when Henry stepped through the door, golf bag still slung across his shoulder. This can't be the right house. It's far too quiet, he said, the way he always did when he arrived home. He leaned the clubs against the wall and stretched out his arms. The twins knew the cue, and they both rushed towards him, enveloping his legs in a tangled hug. Henry pretended to cry out in pain as he swooped them both up in his arms. The girls giggled, and Jessica's heart swelled. Henry hadn't been traditionally handsome when they'd first met. His legs were short and his torso a bit too long, but his nutmeg eyes were kind and his full mouth was quick to smile. But ageing suited him, and at 36 his dark hair was becoming streaked with grey, giving him a distinguished air. She'd noticed a few of the school mothers giving him a second look. But it was Jessica who'd discovered him first. It was almost eight years ago, at the wedding of a mutual friend, when they'd found themselves sitting at an outlying table. She'd been dating someone else, so had no interest in him other than as an amusing table companion. After that, their paths continued to cross, 
and when her current boyfriend had moved to Japan three months later, Henry had asked her out. They'd married the following year. Her life had changed dramatically since then. Even though her income had continued to increase, she hadn't known how to spend it. But Henry had been born into a wealthy family and had excellent taste. So little by little, she'd learnt which boutiques to shop in, what art to hang on the walls, and why one should never let guests help wash up after a supper party. But most importantly, he loved their daughters with a ferocity that Jessica wouldn't have thought possible from his mild demeanour. It was definitely his most attractive quality. Jessica smoothed down her road art skirt and patted her hair as Henry deposited the twins onto a pair of stools near the island, and then he leant over and kissed her. His breath was warm and smelt of mint. How was your grandfather? Let's see. He flirted outrageously with the waitress, drank two G&Ts, and then stole the salt mill, which we didn't discover until we'd returned him to the rest home. But overall, he was good. He remembered us all. His voice was light, but there was no hiding the worry lines that hovered around his mouth. I'm so pleased, Jessica said, knowing how helpless Henry felt about his grandfather's declining health. It was why he liked to play a game of golf after each visit, to help him unwind and process. That makes two of us, he agreed, before inspecting the cake on the bench. The green icing had been covered in bright pink sprinkles and tiny plastic dinosaurs. And what do we have here? It's for supper. Florence leant forwards on the bench, brown hair brushing across her cheeks. We made it, Eleanor clarified, in case there was any confusion over the provenance. And it's green. That was my idea. Florence turned her attention to Jessica. We let Mummy help a little bit. Henry's lips twitched, and he turned to inspect the carefully set table, and then over to the simmering pots on the arger, and the leftover sprigs of rosemary still sitting on the worktop. I can see that. It all looks delicious. Shall we go and play some games until it's ready? He said before turning to her, unless you need a hand. Everything's under control. It should be ready in about 40 minutes. Come on, Daddy, you can play dressing up with us. Florence climbed down from the stool and tugged at his arms. Can I be the princess again? He asked, voice serious. The girls dragged him away, giggling in delight. He turned to Jessica and blew her a kiss. She waited until they'd headed upstairs to the dressing up box in the girls' playroom before turning to her laptop. The potatoes needed at least another half hour, so she could start reviewing the contracts for work that had been sitting on her hard drive. She'd missed a couple of days last week because Florence had a cold. Unfortunately, it didn't stop the work from piling up. She was an in-house lawyer for Zelco, a large international company that worked in oil, minerals and banking. The role crossed a number of different time zones, making it anything but nine to five. She didn't mind the irregular hours, though. It was fulfilling and also let her have enough time with the girls. But before she could bring herself to open the files, tiny needles of anxiety stabbed at her, leaving her unsettled. It was no surprise. She spent all day trying to ignore the mounting dread that was building in her stomach, but she knew from experience that she couldn't hold it at bay forever. Her father's birthday always did that to her, a reminder that he was no longer there. She swallowed, pleased that the girls weren't around to see her. It had been twenty years since he'd died, but it was still a raw, gaping wound that left her dizzy. She'd been twelve when the police had turned up at their house. Her mother had immediately sent her upstairs, but Jessica only went as far as the lounge so that she could listen as they'd spoken in hushed voices. So sorry. A car accident. Died instantly. She didn't cry at first, because it had been like a dream. Like she was listening to her teachers reading a story from a book. But the next day, her mother had made her wear a black dress, 
and they'd gone to the hospital to visit her older sister, Ashley, who'd been a passenger in the car. Jessica had kept looking around for her father, somehow believing he would be in one of the beds. But he wasn't. That was when she'd begun to sob uncontrollably. Even now, she still expected him to walk through the door, soothing away her worries by his mere presence. He'd been her champion, her friend, the person who'd wiped away her tears. Not only had his death taken him away from her, but six months later, her supposedly God-fearing mother had started dating someone else. Like Jessica's dad had never even existed. It was disgusting. Disrespectful. Wayne Driscoll was everything her father wasn't. A boring accountant who went bird-watching and made model trains. Ashley called him Saint Wayne because he didn't drink or smoke, but Jessica refused to join in on the joke. At first, she'd been unable to understand how her mother could go from someone as handsome, funny and dynamic as their father to someone like Wayne. But then she realised the truth of it. Her mother had never loved Philip, and she didn't love her daughters either. And while she and Wayne had eventually got married, Jessica had never been able to forgive her. Deciding not to fight it, she poured herself a glass of wine and walked into the formal living room, which also looked out onto the garden. On the mantel was a small silver frame containing the photo of a man with thick blonde hair, a disarming smile, and mercurial eyes that went from blue to grey, depending on the season. Or at least they had done, back when he was still alive. Philip Burton. Hi, Daddy. She took a sip of Pinot Grige and pressed a finger to the glass that protected the photograph. If she narrowed her eyes, it almost looked like he was smiling back at her. Did you see my girls? Aren't they beautiful? I know how proud you must be of them, she whispered. She only allowed herself to talk to him twice a year, on Father's Day and on his birthday. She was scared that if she did it more, she wouldn't be able to bear the hurt. The slim silver bracelet he'd given her for her birthday just weeks before his death hung on her wrist, catching the June afternoon sun. If he was still alive, he'd have probably been spending the day with them, being spoilt by the twins before joining Henry on the golf course and then coming home for a meal, finishing up sipping wine and watching the sunset together. She finished her wine in one long swallow, just as the oven timer went off, reminding her to start the gravy. She turned away from the photograph and stepped back into her life. Henry's voice drifted down, followed by the girl's squeals of delight. Jessica smiled and walked into the immaculate kitchen. The roast was cooked to perfection, and she carefully lifted it out to use the juices to make the gravy. It would have been easier to use a packet mix, but Henry would know the difference. And so would she. Besides, she didn't mind. She loved this life and knew that many people were envious of her. The perfect husband, the two adorable daughters, and a house that looked like it had come out of a magazine. It was everything she'd longed for when she was growing up. And while she couldn't deny it took a lot of work to hold it all together, as far as she was concerned, it was worth it. She pressed a smile onto her lips and made the gravy. Chapter 2 Monday the 20th of June Why was Henry's alarm so loud? Jessica's head pounded as she slowly opened her eyes, but Henry wasn't on his side of the bed. She could hear him whistling in the bathroom, a faint trail of steam seeping out from under the doorway. Downstairs, the girls were giggling, which meant Henry had already been up and helped them pour the cereal and butter the toast. The noise sounded again, and this time Jessica sat up. It wasn't an alarm clock at all. It was her phone. Groaning, she reached over for it. After dinner the previous night, Henry had gone to bed early, tired from the day out with his father, 
So Jessica had stayed up working on a contract, only stumbling into bed at two o'clock. Now she was paying the price. She rubbed her eyes and stared at the screen. A familiar name flashed up. Sarah Hodges was her sister's landlady. Ashley was an artist who constantly struggled to make ends meet, and despite being four years older, Jessica had lost count of the number of times she'd been forced to bail her out of trouble. It had been the source of most of their arguments. That and her sister's drinking. Their most recent falling out had been last weekend, and had ended with Ashley telling her to fuck off. Jessica got why her sister acted the way she did. Ashley had been 16 at the time of the accident, and had been drinking herself into oblivion ever since. Survivor's guilt. But it was no excuse to take it out on Jessica. Her skin prickled in irritation. Sarah, hi. Is everything okay? I'm sorry to call, but I haven't seen Ashley for a few days and she's behind on her rent by three weeks. Sarah didn't bother to say the word again, but it was implied by the sharp exhale of breath. Jessica forced herself not to let out a bitter laugh. Of course Ashley was behind on her rent, because that's what she did. I'll transfer the money to you this morning and give her a call. Thanks, Jessica. Hopefully you'll have better luck getting through to her than I've had. She hasn't answered any of my messages. A thread of unease raced through her. Jessica had sent her sister several text messages over the weekend, but hadn't received any replies. And while it wasn't unusual for Ashley to go on a bender, especially around their father's birthday, there was always the possibility that it might be something else. Jessica had spent half her life wondering if the police would turn up on her doorstep to tell her something had happened to Ashley. An arrest, an overdose, or... She climbed out of her bed and mentally went through her carefully planned day. After she dropped the twins off at kindergarten, she had several errands to run before being able to sit at her desk, but she could push everything back and have another late night. She hoped her boss would understand. I'd better come over and take a look around her room, if that's okay. Of course, Sarah instantly agreed. The lease is in your name. You're a good sister. Jessica wasn't so sure. A good sister would probably have figured out a way to get Ashley into rehab to deal with the guilt she had over their father's accident. But Jessica had failed and could feel herself becoming more and more bitter about the toll her sister's lifestyle was taking on them both. I'll be there just after the school run. She ended the call and went into her banking app to transfer the money for Ashley's rent. Sarah was already set up in the account. She sent over the three weeks' outstanding rent, plus another two weeks, just in case, because whenever Ashley came back from a bender, it was usually without any money. Then she made the call. It went right to voicemail. This is Ashley. Is my battery flat again? Yeah, let's go with that. Leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I find my charger. Hey, Ash, it's me. Call me as soon as you can. What is it this time? Henry walked back into the room. His wet hair was brushed back from his temples and his jawline was cleanly shaved. A faint scent of his cologne clung in the air as he padded over to the walk-in wardrobe and selected a bespoke suit and a pale blue shirt. She winced, wishing he hadn't overheard her. Henry's family were very conservative and they didn't understand how Ashley could live the way she did. Or, more to the point, why Jessica continued to run around after her sister picking up the pieces. But she could hardly lie to him. Her rent's overdue, and she's missing. Missing? He stopped tucking in his shirt and turned around, raising a questioning eyebrow. As in, really missing? According to her landlady. Jessica tied back her thick blonde hair. There wouldn't be time to wash it before she had to leave the house. When did you last talk to her? On Wednesday. 
We were meant to go out to dinner so we could discuss our argument, but Florence came home with a cold so I had to cancel. Ashley was acting a little odd, but no more than usual. You know what she's like. She always goes quiet this time of year. True. She usually doesn't resurface again until the twins' birthday, Henry said. So what's the plan? I said I'd go over and look through her room, see if I can find out where she is this time. She didn't bother to add that she'd also paid the overdue rent, though she could tell by the tight lines around Henry's mouth that he suspected. She drew in a panicked breath. He'd cheated on her once before, with Annabelle Rigger, a regular in the society pages. They'd dated at university and were a much better match than he and Jessica were, but they'd broken up not long before Jessica had met him. The affair had happened during a rough patch in their marriage, before she got pregnant with the twins. But the moment she'd shown him the ultrasound, Annabelle had been history, and Jessica had never given him a reason to cheat on her again. Unfortunately, her sister didn't seem to take that into account. Ashley had no idea how much her behaviour spilt over into Jessica's marriage. Did she even care? It was doubtful. For a moment, she wondered how much easier her life would be if she wasn't always called to tidy up Ashley's messes. Then she swallowed it down. She still needed to find her. She just hoped Henry would understand. Chapter 3 The traffic was terrible. Although it was only ten miles from Jessica's Victorian house in Kew to Ashley's bedsit in Brixton, it still took her almost an hour. It was like moving from one world to another, taking her away from pristine houses and tree-lined streets through to a jumble of council estates that were dotted along the bank of the Thames and covered in graffiti and litter. Jessica parked outside the double-fronted three-storey terraced house on Bluebell Lane, which wasn't nearly as nice as the name suggested. Instead, it was a wide road that acted as a thoroughfare for traffic moving across the city. The black enamel paint on the door was chipped away, as if someone had tried to pry it open, and the brickwork was dark from the car fumes that passed by almost constantly. Jessica had a key, but she rang the doorbell because she wanted to speak to the landlady first. Sarah Hodges was in her early sixties and had inherited the house over twenty-five years ago from an aunt. She now lived on the ground floor and had turned the other two floors into bedsits. Sarah, together with her electrician husband, kept on top of the upkeep and maintenance of the bedsits. Sorry to drag you out here. I kept hoping she'd turn up, the woman said as she opened the door. Don't be silly. I'm grateful you called. I'm sorry about the late rent. I transferred the money this morning. I'm sure Ashley just got caught up in her painting. You know what artists can be like? She said in a calm voice designed to keep the landlady happy. The truth was that Ashley wasn't a great tenant. Between the drinking, the haphazard attitude to money, and staying up all night working, her sister had been kicked out of several bedsits and studio apartments before moving into Bluebell Lane almost three years ago. The idea of finding her a new place made Jessica feel bone-weary. I do indeed, but whenever I ask her to turn down the music, she's always very apologetic. I think she gets caught up in her own world. Can you tell me when you last saw her? It was Wednesday, so five days ago. Jessica stiffened. Wednesday. The night they were meant to go out to dinner to discuss the argument. Ashley had apologised, but it would take more than an apology for her to be forgiven. Actions spoke louder than words. Did you speak to her? Sarah nodded. She was owed some money from working at a pub, Den of Thieves, over by Peckham Rye Station, so Trevor went with her to fetch it, and she promised me she'd pay the rest very soon. She begged me not to contact you. She was embarrassed about having to ask you to help all the time. I agreed, but... I haven't seen her since, so that's why I decided to call. I'm pleased you did. 
The last time Ashley had disappeared was because she'd gone to Brighton with a friend to have a day at the beach and had ended up staying a week without bothering to tell anyone. I'll go up to her room and take a look around, if that's okay. Of course. Let me know if there's anything else I can do. Thanks. I'll knock on your door when I've finished and we'll talk again. Jessica walked up the stairs to the first floor. Ashley's room was the second on the left. She knocked, but no one answered. Using her own key, she opened the door and walked inside. The stale smell of booze and cigarettes made her gag, and she hurried to the window, drawing back the curtains and lifting up the large sash window to let in some much-needed fresh air. She almost wished she hadn't. There were dirty clothes strewn all over the floor, plates and glasses with mould growing on them, which had clearly been there for weeks, were on every surface. Judging by the overflowing rubbish bin, Ashley had been eating cheap noodles and not a lot else. The bed was unmade, and the grimy pale blue sheets dangled on the floor. The mess was made more startling by the large oil painting that took up most of the wall. It was one of Ashley's own and was huge. Too big for the room, really. It was of an urban street filled with tangled weeds that had cracked through the sidewalk, while thick ivy climbed the buildings as if trying to drag everything back into the earth. A woman was standing at the edge of the painting, but her eyes were covered in cloth so she couldn't really see it. To Jessica, it showed the trouble side to her sister's personality, but Henry thought it was more of a reflection on modern living. Either way, it was very arresting. Jessica had a slight pang of envy. She was good at most things. Music, academic studies, cooking, gardening. But when it came to art, stick figures were about as far as she could stretch. She had no idea where Ashley got it from. No one else in their family was artistic. Her sister could have been so much more if only she hadn't gone down the drink and drugs route. Jessica turned back to survey the filthy room. A few photographs were pinned to a tatty-looking board. Most were of Ashley with different friends. In each one, she had her tongue poking out, like it was a signature. There were also a couple of the twins, and one of Jessica and Ashley when they were young. Despite their different lifestyles, they were similar-looking, both sharing the same blonde hair and sharp cheekbones. The rest of the photographs were of locations. A forest of pines, a glittering lake and a towering mountain. There were no photographs of their parents, and no other decorations to try and make the bedsit feel more homely. How could Ashley live like this? But she already knew the answer. Her older sister was reckless and incapable of focusing on anything apart from her artwork, whereas Jessica was meticulous and needed everything to be in place before she could relax, which is why she found herself collecting the dirty crockery and placing it by the door to take to the kitchen Ashley shared with the other tenants. Jessica made the bed, despite it needing changing, but she didn't know where Ashley kept the clean sheets or even if she had any. She then gathered up the jeans and hoodies that were spread across the floor and began to fold them. She piled them on a chair and then caught sight of a white shirt which was half poking out from under the bed. She pulled it out and held it up. There was a long reddish-brown smudge down one side. It could be paint, considering her sister was in the studio most days working. Or blood, of course. Her vision blurred when competing scenarios crashed into her mind, but she pushed them to one side and returned the shirt to where she'd found it. She wasn't a criminal lawyer, but she knew that tampering with a crime scene was a punishable offence, not only by the court, but she'd also lose her licence to practice. It's not a crime scene, she reminded herself, suddenly feeling silly. She pulled out her phone and searched through her address book. Lisa Wingate was an art college friend of Ashley's who had moved to Liverpool several years ago. 
The call went straight through to voicemail, and so did the next three calls she made to other friends. She left messages for them all, asking if they'd seen Ashley. Sighing, she turned to the white chest of drawers. A couple of bills were crammed in there. The rest were probably sitting in her sister's inbox, unopened as a way of pretending they didn't exist. She pulled out the next drawer. There were two carefully wrapped presents, along with two separate envelopes with the twins' names written on each one. A lime green envelope for Florence and one in hot pink for Eleanor. The twins turned five the coming Saturday, and while most of Ashley's life was a wreck, she loved the two girls almost as much as Jessica and Henry did. Jessica's throat went dry as she recalled the argument last weekend. Ashley had turned up out of the blue to see if she could take them out to an exhibition at the Tate. But she'd been drunk at the time, and Jessica had said no. That was when Ashley had told her to fuck off and stormed out. It had left her shaken, but Henry had reminded her that they'd long ago established that when it came to the twins, Ashley had to be sober. And until now, she had been. So what had happened to make her come to the house drunk? It was hard to tell. Her sister used booze to celebrate good days and commiserate bad. Then again, Jessica suspected she also used it to get up in the morning, and while her sister had been drinking heavily since she was a teenager, whatever demons were chasing her seemed to have become stronger. Another flash of irritation coursed through her. Her sister's refusal to face up to anything uncomfortable was a luxury. Whenever Ashley was upset, she'd reach for a bottle or a line of coke and leave Jessica to deal with the fallout instead of facing up to her responsibilities like an adult. In the final drawer was her diary. Ashley had kept one for years. Jessica had tried once, but all she ever put in there were appointments. Even then she got bored and went back to using an app on her phone. She much preferred to look forward than back. Hopefully it would give her an idea of who Ashley was hanging around with right now. Her sister had the happy knack of making friends, but wasn't so good at keeping them especially after she'd borrowed money, which made it all the harder to work out where she might be. Jessica slipped the diary into her bag, which she slung over her shoulder, then she went to the kitchen with the dirty crockery. There was only one kitchen shared between the eight bedsits, four on each floor. It had two large fridges, one per floor, and tenants had their own shelf. She filled the sink with water using washing up liquid from the cupboard below and then opened the fridge for Ashley's floor and looked at the shelf marked with her sister's name. There was a carton of milk that had gone off, a square of mouldy cheese and half a shriveled cucumber. And that was it. In the cupboard were three pot noodles and two tins of beans. God, her sister was eating like an 18-year-old student rather than a grown-up woman. What did it mean? That she cared so little about herself that she couldn't even eat properly? Or had something happened to stop her from going to the supermarket? Jessica's hands shook, and she took a steadying breath before washing and putting away the plates, glasses and cutlery. Once it was done, she went downstairs and knocked on the landlady's front door. What did you find up there? The woman asked. Nothing but a big mess. I've tidied, washed up, and left everything straight. So what are you going to do? Call the police? The police? She shivered. Was this where it was heading? I hope it won't come to that. I've already started contacting her friends to see if anyone has heard from her. Good idea. I've asked the other tenants, but most of them keep to themselves. Jessica couldn't blame them. If she lived here, she doubted she'd want to socialise with her neighbours either. Thanks for being so understanding. A lot of landlords would have thrown her out by now. I'm very fond of your sister. When she's not out of it, she's a lovely person, caring and considerate. She always asks how I am, and when I sprayed my ankle the other week and my Trevor was out on a job, she helped me get back home. 
She strapped my ankle and made me a cup of tea. It was one of her better days, and she's so talented. Her work is amazing. I suppose she's what people would call a troubled artist. Jessica swallowed. It was the endless conundrum that was her sister. When she was sober, she was loving and warm, especially with the twins who adored her. She was almost like the sister Jessica remembered before the accident. But those days were few and far between. If only Ashley would stop running from the past and face up to her demons. It was the only way for her life to get better. Yes, she is. Hopefully I'll find her soon and get her back here. But please, if you do see her, let me know straight away. Will do. She led Jessica out of the door. It wasn't until she'd climbed into the car that she let her calm smile fade. After the Brighton trip, Ashley had promised not to pull another stunt like that again. So what had happened to make her not come home for five days? especially with the twins' birthday so close. Jessica picked up her phone and cancelled her eleven o'clock meeting. It was clear that the rest of the day would be spent trying to find her sister. There was blood, Henry said an hour later when she'd called him. And what's that noise? Where are you? Somewhere called the Rat, Jessica said, looking around the dive bar that her sister often went to. It was only two blocks from the bedsit, which Jessica could only assume was the main appeal. It certainly wasn't the decor, or the cleanliness. The walls were covered in burgundy and gold wallpaper, complete with an ornate picture rail and heavy gilt mirrors, while the bar top was sticky from years of spilt drinks. Despite smoking being banned, the air was filled with something thick and murky. I'm not sure it was blood. It could have been paint. He didn't answer straight away. She could tell he was judging her sister. She couldn't blame him. Ashley had been the source of several arguments between her and Henry. She rubbed her hand against her brow, trying to find the right words to convince him why she had to discover where Ashley was. Henry was an only child and so struggled to understand the bonds that existed between siblings. Then there was all the money. They could more than afford her paying for Ashley, but Henry's thinking was rigid, and he believed that people were only poor by choice, and that Jessica was merely enabling her sister. OK, he finally said. Have you found anything else? No. She sighed and looked around the rat. The barman was using a toothpick to clean his nails, and the two old men who were nursing beers at the bar had all said the same thing. Ashley usually popped in several times a week, but that none of them had seen her since last Tuesday, almost a week ago. The lack of fresh air was giving her a headache, and her temple pounded. So what now? I called her friend Lawrence, and he said I could visit the studio. I'm hoping he might have some answers, Maybe she's gone on a spontaneous holiday. Without paying her rent or packing any clothes, Henry said before letting out a pained sigh. I'm sorry, Jessica, I know you want to help, but you need to open your eyes. Ashley's not the sister you once knew, she's a drunk. There's a good chance that whatever's happened to her has been self-inflicted. It's not your job to run around after her, you need to go to the police. She grimaced. Henry obviously wanted to distance himself from Ashley, and while she couldn't blame him, the idea of going to the police might do more harm than good. She thought of the bloody shirt under her sister's bed. What would the police think if they found it? It would be better for everyone if Jessica could find Ashley before it escalated. I promise I will, but I need to make sure she isn't just lying low. Imagine how embarrassing it would be to your parents if it reached the newspaper and then Ashley reappeared with nothing worse than a hangover. More silence, and then he let out a long breath. Good point. But don't forget, you didn't create the problem. Whatever Ashley is up to, it's her own fault, not yours. I know, and thank you, she said before finishing the call. 
She pushed away the coffee that she'd ordered earlier. The barman had poured it from an ancient coffee pot that had been sitting underneath the drip filter. It was now cold, and she hadn't been able to bring herself to touch it. She'd only bought it to get the man on side. It hadn't worked, and no one looked at her when she got up to leave. Outside, the bright sunshine made her wince. Her phone rang, but one glance at her boss's number on the screen, and Jessica let it run through to voicemail. She'd make up for the lost hours tonight, and then send her boss a grovelling email. She climbed into her car and started the engine. The art studio was a twenty-minute drive away, but considering Ashley didn't have a car, it probably took her longer. Jessica had been there once before, when her sister had begged her to come along to a party. It had been horrible, full of drunk, artsy-looking people who used metaphors to explain just about everything, including where the toilet was. Jessica had refused to go out with her sister again. But the place looked different in the bright morning sun. It had once been a boat builder's workshop, and the old sign still hung above the doorway. The brick walls had been painted white, and several sections of the roof had been replaced with windows so that the light poured in. There seemed to be at least seven different studios within the warehouse, all broken up by wall dividers. Several of the spaces had paintings and sculptures dotted around to mark the entrance, but they all dimmed in comparison to the huge mural that her sister had done. It ran along one wall and was a twist of tree branches, all tangled up as if forming a cage. Fingers could be seen clutching at the branches, but it was impossible to tell if they were keeping the people out or keeping them in. Extraordinary, isn't it? Lawrence walked towards her. He was tall and skinny with a mop of strawberry blonde hair and a thin aristocratic face. He wasn't traditionally handsome, but definitely had an air about him, especially with his tanned skin. It is, Jessica agreed, her eyes still scanning the room, as if hoping to catch sight of her sister's messy blonde hair. Thanks for meeting me. Of course. Though I'm still not clear what's going on. Has Ashley really disappeared? Jessica swallowed. No, well, I'm not sure. That's why I'm hoping you can come in. When was the last time you saw her? He gave her an apologetic look. Not for a week. I was in Spain for a few days and got back last night. I'd invited Ashley to come along, but she refused. Let's think. He paused and rubbed his chin. It must have been last Monday. Two days before Sarah, and one day before the regulars at the Rat. So she hadn't been seen for five days. She'd been on benders that had lasted longer. Has she called or texted you? No, but that's not unusual. When she's in the studio, she gets lost in her own world. Christ, do you think something's happened to her? I hope not. Did you notice anything odd? Was she acting differently? He didn't return her gaze. I really... Please, she said, not wanting him to shut down... No one understands Ashley better than I do. I know she drinks too much and isn't always the most reliable, but she's my sister and I love her. I want to find her. There's nothing you can say that will shock me. A flash of guilt crossed his face. Okay. She was on edge, like she had something on her mind. And she was drinking more than usual. I'd arranged for her to meet a gallery owner last Monday. It was a big deal, but she was so hungover she could barely string a sentence together. I was a tad annoyed, to say the least. Jessica flinched. She'd run into Ashley's ability to self-sabotage on numerous occasions, but it was obviously a new experience for Lawrence. Did she say what was bothering her? He shook his head and flushed. We spend a lot of time together, but it's usually messing around and having fun. She doesn't tend to talk about anything personal. He was cut off by the buzz of his phone. He glanced at the screen, then gave her an apologetic smile. Sorry, I have to get this, but let me know as soon as you hear from her. No, don't go, Jessica wanted to protest. 
She still had questions and a burning need to search the entire studio. But she stopped herself. Ashley was the crazy one. Instead, she forced herself to smile. Will do, and thanks for your help. He dipped his head in acknowledgement and she walked back outside. The sun had fallen behind the buildings as she climbed back into her car. She still had an hour before she had to pick the twins up. This was like a bad dream. It couldn't be real. Sure, Ashley drank a bit more than she should, but everyone loved her and thought she was sweet and kind. Except that it wasn't true. Ashley's ability to blow up her life stemmed from low self-esteem and self-loathing. Now she was missing, and no one seemed to know where she was. Once again, she thought of the rag in her sister's bedsit, the one that looked like it was covered in blood. Jessica's skin prickled, and her chest went tight as Henry's words came back to her, that she needed to open her eyes and see the truth about her sister. She was an alcoholic, and that could lead to trouble. The fact that she'd spent the day searching for Ashley should have comforted her, but it didn't. She'd failed, and now there was only one other option. Jessica picked up her phone and dialed 999. It was time to get some help. Chapter 4 Brixton Police, how may I help? The man who answered said. I'd like to report a missing person, Jessica said in a cool voice. The operator had decided that her call wasn't enough of an emergency and had advised her to call her sister's local police station. That had been 20 minutes ago and she'd been waiting on the line ever since. Just one moment, please. I'll put you through. The phone rang for ages before someone finally picked up. CID? DC Finch speaking? The officer's voice was sharp and insistent.